is a textbook submarine attack. You blow your load and then you run, okay? You skeet and retreat, you ejaculate and you evacuate. The USS Steelhead is out. They fight. See, I wasn't in the wrong in making those phallic assertions before. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> giant, giant metal dick <laughs> shooting his load and then <laughs> skedaddling. <laughs> oh my God. How's it going ladies and gentlemen? Well, mostly gentlemen. Jack here with another reaction to The Fat Electrician. It's been a while, but I've been getting a bunch of recommendations, especially with regards to US boats. I, I don't know what's going on there. There must be um, something special about them. Look, I too do like boats, or I guess we should say ship. Which, hold on, before we get moving, there's never a consistent metric for the nomenclature for boats or ships. I remember my biology teacher in high school being very mad at us when we got this wrong because for his metric was that everything above 500 tons was, at least I could have a carry weight of 500 tons, was a ship. But there are plenty of vessels like that that are still called boats. So I don't know. Whatever the matter, there are three videos here that seem very interesting to me. There's one, Operation Praying Mantis, that I think I have heard of before. Uh, there's also the uh, US, <laughs> not quite US, but a German sub that was stolen by some US uh, soldiers, as well as the latest upload that he has here, the Ramish Rampage. I'm gonna go with this one because I don't know much about US submarines, because to my knowledge, the US had two things going for them. During World War II, that is, being tanks and the battle fleets. Like, they were amazing. But without further ado, let us just get straight into it. Ah yes, that time a single US submarine took on an entire 23-ship convoy by itself. Ooh. Today we're talking about the USS Parchy and its commander, Lawson Red Ramage, the first submarine commander in US history to earn the Medal of Honor and survive. But first, a word from our sponsor. Mm. Sponsor money for my breast reduction. What? Uh, I... Thanks. <laughs> There's no ad this week. Moving on. Ramage. <laughs> I'm gonna say respectfully, this man has got his priorities in order. <laughs> He was born in 1909 and graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1931. After graduating from the Naval Academy, he would serve on destroyers as an engineering officer, a radio officer, and a navigator. Then in 1935, he decides that he wants to try out to be on a submarine. So he goes in, takes his physical, and fails immediately because his vision isn't good enough because he has an eye injury from when he wrestled in high school. The very second he fails that vision test, he makes a decision. He decides that he's not going to let this stop him from serving on a submarine. In a demonstration of grit and determination, he decides that he is going to take that vision test he's again gonna cheat. tomorrow. And unlike this time, next time he takes his <laughs> he's test, gonna cheat. he's going to fucking cheat. Because if you're not <laughs> cheating, you're not trying. So as he makes his way out, he... Yo, we, we talked about this before with regard to the um, soldiers who will be drafted and or those who will be conscripted into the war, like the age, of course. But a lot of them actually got in there by straight up cheating, like being kind of like, you know, the Captain America scenario with Steve Rogers. Like you are actually in app for this, but uh, you're going to make it somehow. Somehow you will be on that battlefield. Like whatever camp you're sent to is going to scratch their heads, but you will be there. He instructs a couple of his friends to memorize a different line of the vision test, gets that information from them later, puts the entire thing together, memorizes the entire vision test verbatim, and shows back up the next day ready to take this test again. So he takes a vision but test, gets 100%, no problem whatsoever. At this point, the optometrist, the, the, the same optometrist from yesterday is like, I know, oh no. I know what you're doing. So he goes over, changes the board, and he's like, okay, now read me that one. At this point, Ramage is like, shit. But he figures, hey, we're already here. We're going to give it a shot anyways. So he covers up his bad eye first, reads the lines the doctor tells him to read. Doctor tells him to switch eyes and he goes and recovers his bad eye again, reads the lines the doctor tells him to read. In the back of his head, he's like, I cannot fucking believe that this just worked. And the doctor is like, oh, hey, you passed. You must have just like had a bad day yesterday or something. Budweiser presents Real Men of Genius. Real Men of Genius. <laughs> I know that the ad for that used to be used to make fun of like how we tend to not live pretty long by making some stupid ass decisions, but my man. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, 
Yeah, that was it. Anyways, now he's going to submarine warfare school. So he goes off, gets trained in submarine warfare, does great, ends up getting assigned to his first submarine, the USS S-29. He works there for about eight months. Then he gets rotated over to Pearl Harbor, where he is the sound and communications officer working directly under the commander of the entire Pacific submarine fleet. And that is wow. where he is on December 7th, 1941, when Pearl Harbor is attacked, AKA the Japanese commit the biggest cardinal sin on Touching the planet, US boats. fucking with America's boats. Don't, don't you dare! If you put one fin on that boat, of course, don't touch Nemo, Nemo. <laughs> Yikes, dude! I am aware of like the U.S. boats. I don't know quite how the submarines did fare. From what I remember, my dad telling me, like the Germans were specifically good at what they did with the Greyhounds. Which, okay. <clears throat> I mentioned two things, right? The fleet and the tanks. We've seen the movies. You've seen Fury, right? With, uh, what his name? Uh, John Berthold, uh, Shia LaBeouf, and of course, War Daddy. I can't believe that I call him that. Brad Pitt in the role there. But of course, there's Tom Hanks' Greyhound movie, where he has to navigate the entire fleet to avoid this submarine that was haunting them. Like, I know of those tactics, right? Uh, the, the, the Greyhounds and stuff. Cool. But to my knowledge, US submarines were exceptionally bad at these, not the submarines themselves, but the torpedoes. Because not to get too phallic with it, uh, they were very premature in their <laughs> explosion. At least at the time. Are you kidding me? Drop some lead on those motherfuckers! Battleship. <laughs> Poor little guy. Dead. So obviously all of America is extremely pissed off, but Ramage is exceptionally pissed because he was actually there at Pearl Harbor when it happened. And here's the catch with that, right after Pearl Harbor, over half the American surface fleet was temporarily out of commission due to all the damage, meaning that the only answer that America had at this point in time was the submarine fleet. To which Ramage is like, put me okay. in a sub, I want to go get some revenge. So that's exactly what happens. He gets assigned to the USS Grenadier as a navigation officer. They go out and sink two Japanese ships right off the bat and Ramage is awarded a silver star for his contribution. So right off the bat, Ramage is obviously doing pretty good. At this point, they decide they're gonna give him his own submarine. He becomes a commander of the USS Trout. Okay, now here's the thing with being a commander of a submarine during World War II. You were only allowed to go out with the same submarine and the same crew as its commander for a total of four war patrols because the leadership believed that after four war patrols, a commander would either become too reckless or too conservative and they had to rotate him out. So Ramage goes through his first three war patrols and they are just not going the way that he had hoped. It's not the heroic revenge that he was really looking for. After three war patrols, he only manages to sink three Japanese ships. And just to be clear, that's not for lack of trying. He goes out and finds a ton of Japanese ships and shoots an abundance of torpedoes at all of them. But every single time that he fires the American Mark 14 torpedo, it either veers off course or it hits, but then doesn't blow up. It becomes very clear ah. to Red Ramage that he, his crew, and the USS Trout are- Oh, so, okay, so it was- Wait a minute. Did my dad tell me some lies? So they were just duds. To my understanding, like I, I, I felt for the longest time that they were just like uh, very premature and just went deeper than they were supposed to. Well, that would then make sense, right? With the fact that they will constantly miss despite you actually accurately targeting them. So perhaps that part he got right. <laughs> but yeah. Just to clarify, my dad, or should I rather say my stepdad, is an old war nerd. And uh, he's actually an educated chemist. But, uh, luckily, I want to say luckily, uh, we didn't dive much into uh, that part of his hobby. <laughs> Would you imagine? I might have lost an arm or something. Or not the problem here, it is the American Mark 14 torpedo. During their second war patrol, they actually find the Japanese battleship, the Kirishima, and Ooh. fire five torpedoes at it, and all five of them veer off course, miss, or are duds. Don't get me wrong, it all works out in the end because the greatest battleship commander of all time, Admiral Willis Ching Lee, ends up sinking the Kirishima with the USS Washington in the greatest battleship versus battleship conflict the world has ever seen, but Red Ramage is still absolutely furious 
that he didn't get that glory because he should have sank the Kirishima right then and there. So fast forward, Ramage and the USS Trout are on their third war patrol. They go to sink a Japanese cargo ship. Ooh, they fire two torpedoes at it, which is absolutely enough to take out a cargo ship. Surprise, surprise. One of them is a complete dud. The other one like kind of half ass explodes, but not really damaging the ship a little bit. And Ramage is just absolutely furious with the situation altogether. At this point, he's on his third war patrol. He's only sank two ships so far. He is absolutely sinking this cargo ship. He doesn't care what it takes. He orders his crew to surface the USS Trout. Everybody runs out on the bridge and starts opening fire on this cargo ship with 50 caliber machine guns, anti-aircraft guns, and the three inch deck gun on the submarine. This Jesus. Is, this is not how you're supposed to conduct submarine warfare, no. but also the torpedoes are supposed to fucking explode. So whatever. So they roll up on this cargo ship on the surface, firing at it the entire time, get within like 500 yards of it, and then shoot two more torpedoes torpedoes at it, blowing it up and sinking it immediately. This is basically the naval equivalent of an execution. Then he yeah, and like that has got to be very frustrating when you are supposed to carry an operation like that because you are kind of ruining sort of the purpose of a submarine. Like, don't get me wrong, submarines are freaking cool, but like they, not, they don't just serve the purpose as like straight up an attacking... <clears throat> I'm sorry, apparatus, if you could say, use that word, but they are also used for psychological warfare because they are these like underwater giant metal dicks that can fuck you up whenever and you do not know when it's going to happen. That is supposed to be the whole kick. But when you see some dude, now in this case, the Americans just coming on the surface and just starting blasting. What are you gonna say? You gotta start mocking them. You're not going to take them seriously. Now, on one end, this might play to your advantage if that was the intent of making the enemy uh, kind of uh, put their defenses down or uh, lower their guard, but this is not the case. I fully understand that he was mad. Then he finishes out the third war patrol, goes back to Pearl Harbor, in person, goes to his chain of command and is like, look, these torpedoes Get your are engineers garbage. They do working. not work. We have to do something about this. And his chain of command tells him to his face, the torpedoes work. You just don't know how to aim. This is your fault, not ours. To which point Ramage basically just throws his arms up in the air because there's literally nothing he can do other than just do his job and keep failing because his chain of command refuses to listen to him. So that's what he does. He goes out on his fourth war patrol. Oh, on no. his fourth war patrol, he shoots 15 torpedoes. All 15 of them are misses and duds. And the Oh man, that sucks. This is very much akin to this whole thing with the uh, star Starship Trooper gun, where like literally telling the engineers, well, not the engineers, but the higher ups in the chain of command, like tell your engineers to fix this stuff. And they're like, no, no, we think it works. Like they have no freaking idea. The worst part is, remember I said earlier, you only get four war patrols as a commander before you're labeled as too conservative or too reckless. Well, yeah. because on his fourth war patrol, Ramage didn't manage to sink any Japanese ships, he is labeled as too conservative, despite the fact that he shot almost every <laughs> torpedo he had and they were all just duds. I mean, Ramage literally just did a drive-by execution with a submarine on his last war patrol, yet somehow they're gonna call him too conservative, which serves to infuriate him even more because he takes it like they're basically calling him a coward. But hey, no. there's absolutely nothing he can do about it. So he heads back over to Pearl Harbor, then they send him all the way over to Maine where he is to oversee the creation hey. and commission of his new submarine, the Baleo class USS Parchy. So that's exactly what he does. Goes over to Maine, watches some people finish building a submarine, goes through a couple of sea trials, passes, gets it commissioned, and now he has to sail it all the way from Maine back over to Pearl Harbor before he can get back into this fight. And by the time he gets back to Pearl Harbor and gets out on his first war patrol with the USS Parchy, it is now March 1944. Okay, real quick, okay. I need you to understand a ton has changed between early 1942, right after Pearl Harbor, when Ramage was first commanding submarines, and now mid-1944. First First off, the good news, they fixed the fucking torpedoes and those actually work now because apparently everybody else that came after Ramage had the exact same issue and the naval committees tried to fight it off saying that everybody had bad aim and eventually due to overwhelming evidence, they were forced to accept the fact that these torpedoes actually sucked and this is now a pretty much universally and historically accepted fact. So Look, he is totally right when it comes to the change there in technology. Like, I'm not one to claim that war necessitates technological advancements. 
it's, it's not always the case, but it would be very hard to deny the leaps and bounds that we had in technology during that short time frame. Like, for example, at, at the time, right, we know about the Enigma machines that the Germans had uh, back in the 20s. But then you move a little bit further, you have like a Colossus, the ENIAC, the actual computers that were manufactured yeah during like uh, 43 to 45 like massive things man and of course weapon technology not not even to get into that one like the japanese had their parts with their planes which got a lot faster i believe that uh, i've talked about this in the video before yeah when i made a reference to uh, the fictional biography of jiro horikoshi by uh, uh, japan and the, uh, J japan and the us's top hater ayao miyazaki some people are gonna hit me in the comment like miyazaki hates japan his father was uh, an airplane engineer and also uh, had an airplane company so it was a sponsor to the japanese war at his war effort in world war ii so he was very much feeling ashamed and always wanted his dad to admit in his part in it but of course he also hated what the us did to his country and uh, especially because he grew up during the time of uh, hiroshima and nagasaki but the point is japan's airplane technology got a lot better during that time they caught up to the germans but unfortunately it seems like uh, the us had uh, all the plans in mind by catching up with their submarines then so, Ramage was right all along about the whole torpedo thing. Now, the bad news, kind of. After the torpedoes started being way more effective, the Japanese started doing what America was doing over at the Atlantic when they were getting oh, attacked fleets. by the German U-boats. They started having convoys of A all convoy, the yeah, ships yeah, yeah. that were being defended by an escort of naval ships that would fight off the submarines. And now Japan is doing that. So America copied what Germany did, <laughs> and they are now sending out submarines as groups in wolf packs wolf to hunt packs, down yes. these convoys together. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but the majority of submarine commanders are not happy about it because they liked the idea of going out there alone, being in complete control of the situation, so and having command over everything and everyone around them. And now they have two other submarines that they have to worry about, and each wolf pack has its own commander over the entire operation, as well as each submarine having its own commander. And the wolf pack yeah. commander is on somebody else's submarine. So one of the three subs in the wolf pack is going to have this weird power dynamic where there's like the overall mission boss there but that guy's not in control of the sub but he kind of is because he's in control of the whole operation and it just makes the whole situation awkward so red and his new ship the uss parchy go well, wasn't it all to make sure that they wouldn't go power crazy i would assume at least that that would have been a, a way that the higher ops intended to mitigate that some people went power crazy because they might have experienced that i don't know but yeah it would be very confusing whether you are the actually co commanding officer or just like somebody who has to operate something on the ship like <laughs> who am i supposed to listen to go out on patrol and they're with the uss bang and the uss tenosa and things are already looking up in their first patrol the wolf pack sinks five ships and the parchy is credited with two of them the second war patrol however shit's gonna get a little bit out of hand because red ramage and the uss parch draw the short straw and they have to have the wolf pack commander on their submarine creating an awkward power dynamic between lawson red ramage the commander of the uss parch and the commander of the wolf pack lou parks and they pretty much immediately get off on the wrong foot because lou parks shows up and is like hey let's call our wolf pack parks as pirates because i'm lou parks i'm in charge and you guys can be my pirates it'll be great to which ramage That's is like i'm, I'm so not playing weird. second fiddle to anybody hear me out what if we call our wolf pack the headhunters because i'm a redhead Sounds and the other way two better. submarines are the uss hammerhead and the uss steelhead and headhunters sounds way cooler than pirates yeah. so they're already not getting along but regardless they get underway they get the second war patrol kicked off and they're gonna go take the fight to the enemy so july 30th 1944 like eight o'clock at night the uss parchy gets a radio transmission from the USS Steelhead. Hey, I found an enormous convoy of Japanese ships. We should attack them. To which 
Ramage is like, absolutely. I've been looking to get into a good firefight for a while now. <laughs> Let's go. And he takes off full steam ahead straight towards that convoy. So originally the USS Parchy was like 30 miles away. They've been traveling at full speed for hours, like three hours now. They still haven't seen a single thing. Ramage wants to radio back over to the USS Steelhead, who's supposed to be tracking the convoy and be like, hey, did they change course? What's going on? We should have intercepted them by now. Lou Parks, on the other hand, is like, no, that's not the protocol. We need to maintain radio sign silence and just keep going potentially the wrong way until somebody else gets a hold of us. So Damn it, dude, let the man get his revenge. They have a fight. Eventually, they end up radioing over to the USS Steelhead and the USS Steelhead is like, yeah, they changed course hours ago and you guys are like way off course, headed the wrong direction. So now Ramage is pissed off that he wasn't allowed to make that radio transmission a couple hours prior and he's like, you know what? I'm just going to start giving orders and I'm going to go over Lou Parks' head. This is my sub. I'm just going to do this. So that's exactly what he does. <laughs> Gets the new coordinates, takes off towards that convoy. USS Parchy finally catches up now, just so we're all on the same page. These are diesel powered submarines of World War II. They travel on the surface at night. They submerge during the day. While yeah. they're on the surface, they are significantly faster and way more maneuverable. And since this is nighttime, they are traveling on that. the surface. So the USS Parchy radios over to the USS Steelhead and they're like, hey, we're here. We can't really see anything. There's like no moonlight out on this particular night. It's just pitch black absolutely everywhere Ooh, to which the USS Steelhead is like, okay, vintage. cool. If you're close, we're going to start our attack run and then we can just figure it out from there so the uss steelhead goes to engage the convoy now these baleo class submarines have 10 torpedo tubes six in the front four in the back uss steelhead approaches fires its six front torpedo tubes does a u-turn fires nice. the remaining four out the back as it's driving away it then goes submerges and leaves it is a textbook submarine attack you blow your load and then you run okay you <laughs> skeet and retreat you ejaculate and you evacuate the uss steelhead is out they fire see i wasn't in the wrong in making those phallic assertions before so yeah 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 <laughs> giant giant metal dick <laughs> shooting his load and then <laughs> skedaddling <laughs> Oh my god. Fired 10 torpedoes, all of them were hits, they sank two ships and damaged one more, and now the entire convoy is on high alert. They shoot up star clusters, flares, lighting up the entire ocean so they can see absolutely everything, and now Ramage can see them too. So Ramage is out on the bridge of his submarine with his binoculars, looking as the sky lights up from all these flares that the Japanese have just shot up trying to find other ships. And if you don't know, the bridge is like literally outside. He's standing yeah, yeah. outside on top of his submarine with a pair of binoculars, looking at this convoy and it is a massive convoy it's got like six hey. destroyers guarding like 17 cargo ships and all the destroyers are peeling out and they're coming to hunt down any other submarines that are out there they're coming for him. At this point, Ramage are like, cool, the destroyers broke their formation, fanning out to come find him. He's going to use this opportunity to slip past them, make his way towards the cargo ships, and blow those up. So, he goes into an evasive maneuver that he calls the reverse spinner. Basically, a 270 degree turn, making it appear to the destroyers as though he's running away, but he turns so tight, and it's so dark out there, that they lose track of him, and he actually goes right past them towards the cargo ships. Now, Ramage doesn't know this yet, but as they're performing this super tight turn evading the destroyers the entire cargo ship convoy changes their course and goes towards him as well so when he comes he's gonna stuck in there 70 degree turn he is actually in the middle of this cargo ship convoy formation he is now completely surrounded in the middle of this cargo ship formation nobody knows he's there and he is literally so close to these cargo ships that he can't fire on the majority of them because they are within like 200 yards and that's not enough time for the torpedoes to even arm so but on the other on the flip side though they can't fire at him either with of course uh, the fear of hitting each other and of course the main ship that's actually pretty smart now this is just an unforeseen turn of events he's so close that he can't actually hurt those ships but the bright side he's actually kind of being protected by the cargo ships as well because now the destroyers aren't going to be able to penetrate through that formation to come get him so it's a super awkward silent moment nobody really <laughs> knows what to do and ramage is like okay fine i'm gonna go forward i'm gonna do a u-turn and then i'm gonna fire at one of the ships from behind. So that's exactly what they do. They maneuver deeper into the formation. They get enough distance on one of the ships to be able to fire, fire two torpedoes, and they fucking miss. So they are in the middle of this cargo no. ship formation. They have fired two torpedoes at one of the ships, but because they missed, 
Nobody has any idea that they're there yet, still. Now, at this moment, one of the men on the bridge with Ramage points out, oh shit, there's two aircraft carriers over there, as he points to the other side of this convoy. Okay, formation. priorities. And at this moment, Ramage has to make a decision. He can take what is potentially a pretty easy win and shoot off a couple of these cargo ships that are on the fringe of this convoy formation, or he can take this opportunity, while nobody knows he's there, penetrate deeper into this formation and potentially take out two aircraft carriers, Guess into which is like the number the one priority ship to take out during World War II. He yeah. decides he's going to go for it. He maneuvers a submarine further and further into this convoy formation, and as he gets closer to these aircraft carriers, he figures out they're not actually aircraft carriers, they're oil tankers, but that Same is still shit. a I mean, major objective to take out. At this point, Frank Alcorn, the torpedo from the officer supplies. the conning tower, is like, hey, I've been keeping track of that first ship that we missed. We're perfectly lined up on the stern side to take a shot at it with another torpedo. Do you want to do it? Ramage is like, absolutely take the shot. They fire a single torpedo and score their first hit of the night. Then he turns his attention back to the tanker. They fire the four remaining torpedoes from the front at this tanker. All four hit and sink the tanker immediately. At this point, all hell breaks loose as the Japanese realize that there is a submarine inside of their formation as the cargo ships begin veering <laughs> off, trying to make room for the destroyers and the destroyer escorts to penetrate the formation to be able to take out the USS Parchi. And you have to remember, Nanny. Ramage only has three torpedoes left and they are all on his stern side, so he orders a tight U-turn as they get the ass end of the submarine lined up with that second tanker, which unbeknownst to them at the time is actually the Oguru Maru, the flagship for the entire convoy with the convoy commander on board. They get it lined up and fire their three remaining torpedoes. They have one miss and two hits bringing that flagship to a limp, almost a complete stop, critically damaging it. And that's it. That's the end of it, right? I mean, the torpedo tubes are empty. The only thing left to do is submerge and make a clean getaway. Oh, hell no. But apparently not today. As the USS Parchi comes under heavy machine gun fire from the escorts and the destroyers trying to defend the convoy, Commander Ramage decides that he's going to do some gangster Dive. shit. He orders everybody off the bridge, including his boss, Lou Parks. Just complete dad energy of go wait in the car, I'll handle this. As everybody on the bridge... No. No. Dude went on demon time, said, witness me. <laughs> I can do this myself. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking Thanos. <laughs> okay. She makes her way back down into the submarine. Ramage points out the quartermaster. You, you're staying with me. I need somebody to be my witness. Basically, just stand <laughs> in the corner and yell World Star. <laughs> he literally said, witness me. <laughs> this is too good. This is literally too good. Well, I do this. It is now just Commander Ramage oh, and his quartermaster on the bridge taking machine gun fire as Ramage orders his crew to refill the torpedo tubes, which I cannot stress to you enough, is absolutely unprecedented. Literally yeah, no one has massive. ever tried this in combat in U.S. Navy history at this point in time. And a lot of you are probably like, well, what's the big deal with reloading a torpedo tube in the middle of combat? I mean, people reload guns in the middle of combat all the time. Yeah, Shell? they reload guns. This is not the same thing, okay? These torpedoes are 20 feet long and weigh 3,000 fucking pounds, okay? This is like 10 yeah. grown men about to give themselves hernias while they're using winches and hoists and all kinds of machinery and shit to load these gigantic explosive metal dicks into a tube to shoot at the enemy. This is not something that you want to be doing on the surface of the ocean, period, getting knocked around by the waves, but you especially don't want to be they doing it the in the middle of combat while you're getting shot at on the surface. And now the crew is also trying to reload these enormous torpedoes while they're performing evasive maneuvers, but somehow they managed to get two torpedoes up in a matter of like four minutes which i cannot stress to you enough is absolutely incredible Ram what the f okay i i guess the they, they should have been participants of that uh what's, what's the name of the show again a physical hundred god damn that's good coordination and strength Ramage then immediately lines up the front of the USS Parchi with the first ship he sees, fires both torpedoes, two hits, sends it to the bottom of the ocean. Then Ramage does a tight U-turn and doubles back towards the flagship, which is now basically dead in the water, waiting for his men to reload more torpedoes. As he gets closer and closer, the torpedoes still aren't up yet, and that's when he gets an idea. He pulls the submarine right up to the ass end of the Aurora <laughs> Maru, basically hiding behind it from all the other gunfire, because these ships don't want to fire on their own flagship. You could literally 
literally reach out Looney from the Tunes. USS Parchee <laughs> and touch this ship is how close they were. He got it so close that the guns on the Aguru Maru couldn't actually shoot at it. And he's just sitting there wow. waiting, hiding behind their own flagship. Then a couple minutes later, he gets word that there are three torpedoes up on the stern side. He peels off in a hard right, accelerates away, lines up the ass end of the sub up with the flagship, fires three torpedoes, sending it to the bottom of the ocean. In all the commotion and the darkness of night, the Japanese lose track of where the USS Parchi is. And now it's just out in the middle of the formation in the darkness as spotlights are searching for it everywhere as Ramage scans around looking for his next target. And he's looking and he's looking and he's totally in the zone trying to figure out the next most important target that they can take out while his crew is down below reloading more torpedoes. Ramage is so in his own headspace and he's the only man on the bridge besides a quartermaster that he doesn't manage to notice that there is a gunship headed straight oh, towards him attempting crap. to ram him and cut the USS Parchee in half. The quartermaster, the only other man on the bridge that could see this coming, tries to get Red's attention, but he can't. So Captain. he yells down into the sub that they're about to be rammed. And at this point, the helmsman, Chet Stinton, takes matters into his own hands and he orders full speed ahead. He doesn't know what direction he needs to go, but he knows that being Just up evade. to speed when he finds out is going to make all the difference. Moments later, Ramage sees a gunship bearing down on them. Oh shit, and he orders full speed ahead, but his crew's already done it. And now yeah. it's just a matter of waiting to see if they're going to make it as the gunship gets closer and closer as the USS Parchee desperately tries to get out of its way. As Kudos to his man. Like, they knew. They knew what the commander was on. Like, <laughs> I know, he's in his airspace. He's long gone. Way to focus on that one target. Let's act accordingly. We're gonna do what a commander would have wanted us to do. As the collision course of the gunship passes the midline of the USS Parchee, Commander Ramage orders a hard right, kicking the ass into the sub out of the way as the gunship and the USS Parchee Crazy. drive right past each other, headed Ooh, opposite not directions. Even touching. And as they pass one another, Commander Red Ramage looks over at the control tower of the gunship and tips his cap in a complete gangster move as he makes his way towards his next target. Alas, my children. This is the day you should always remember is the day that you almost... Most... God, Captain Jack Sparrow. Jack <laughs> Commander Ramage regains his bearings and he is now out of the frying pan and into the fire because he is boxed in by a ship on either side and there is an enormous troop transport headed right at him and if they meet in a head-on collision, Parchi is not going to win. So he does the only thing he can do. He slows the ship down trying to buy more time before this collision as his men frantically try to reload the torpedo tubes at the front of the USS Parchi. They get two torpedoes up moments later and he fires them immediately which is absolutely not ideal to be firing torpedoes at at the front of a ship. They could glance off the side. Yeah. It's a smaller target to hit. It's just ill-advised altogether, but it's the only option that they have. And as fate would have it, both torpedoes would hit bringing this enormous nice. troop carrier to a screeching halt, dead in its tracks. This gives Ramage just enough room to shoot the gap, breaking out of the Japanese convoy formation, and as they cross the midline of this troop carrier, they make another hard left, lining up the ass end of the sub, nice. as the crew gets one last torpedo up and ready to fire at this troop transport. And as the USS Parchi makes its getaway, putting distance between itself and the Japanese convoy, it fires that last torpedo, sinking that Japanese troop carrier with over 5,000 troops on board Oof. where over half of those men would be lost at sea. At this point, the USS Parchi is absolutely going to make a clean getaway and Ramage knows that as he looks back and watches the escorts and destroyers try to chase him down before he gets ready to go back below deck so they can submerge. One of the destroyers using its signal light signals to Ramage, who are you? <sighs> What's your name? To which I presume the quartermaster is like, why do they want to know your name? And Ramage is like, because their officers are going to have a lot of paperwork to do. As they go <laughs> back below deck, the USS Parchee submerges. They make their clean getaway after 34 minutes of combat where the USS Parchee fired a record-breaking 19 torpedoes and That's sustained wild. virtually zero damage in return. So Red Ramage, the crew, and the USS Parchee all make their way back to Pearl Harbor to prematurely end their second war patrol, which they kind of had to do considering they just shot virtually all of their torpedoes. And by yeah. the time they make it back to Pearl Harbor, the entire Navy has heard this story and they're starting to call it Ramage's Rampage. And they are actually <laughs> greeted at the dock by the Rear Admiral in command Vice of the Admiral. entire Pacific Submarine Force, Rear Admiral Charles Lockwood. And he credits the USS Parchi with sinking five enemy ships for a total of 34,000 tons. Now, to be perfectly intellectually honest, that is what they were originally credited with sinking. Later on, a committee that was comprised 100% of people that 
weren't fucking there, got together and they oh, decided no. that they didn't think that he actually sunk that many ships. Now, bear in mind, this is the same type of committee that also said that the Mark 14 torpedo was perfectly fine and everybody else just had bad aim. So this committee and its infinite wisdom We, we, together, we are they, back to uh, the McNasties and... Um... Uh, Sir Douglas Bada uh, kind of scenario where people are like, no, he didn't really do that. Like, were you there? <laughs> were you bloody there? Listen to the man who witnessed it. They decide that Commander Ramage, the USS Parchy, and its crew only what? managed to sink two enemy ships during their entire 34 minute battle where they shot 19 torpedoes at like point blank range. But whatever. That's what's on some of the official records, but everybody knew the real truth. And for that reason, Commander Lawson P. Red Ramage was awarded the Medal of Honor and became the first submarine commander to do so and survive. And Ramage 100% wow. credited his survival to his crew, and he felt that his Medal of Honor was just as much theirs as it was his. Oh, and that's for that kind. reason, he made a certificate and gave it out to every single man in his crew, and it read as follows. Quote, The captain wishes to emphasize the fact that the Medal of Honor was accepted from the President of the United States as the nation's tribute to a fighting ship and her courageous crew. He feels every officer and man whose loyal cooperation and able assistance contributed to the success of the USS Parchy has an equal share in this award, which he holds in trust for you with pride and respect. Sincerely, L.P. Ramage. And that is amazing leadership. I mean, they did also make some right calls without his uh, say-so, at least before he eventually said. But yeah, great. In conclusion, this has been the story of Ramage's Rampage, an awe-inspiring tale of both leadership and teamwork, as well as a cautionary tale of the lengths that a single American will go to whenever somebody <laughs> fucks with America's boats. Stop touching the boats. I can give you endless amounts of examples, and somebody's still gonna do it, okay? Just don't. No touching. You can no take the tanks, you can Thank take you uh, <laughs> planes. Don't touch Church. the boats. Quack bang. Out. <laughs> Nobody listens. I mean, in 1941, somebody touched America's boats and we invented a fucking portable star to get our revenge. <laughs> I don't even want to know what they have now. That was amazing. I, I especially appreciate uh, the depiction that was there with the animation. That that was very uh, that was very much needed. But guys, thank you so much for checking out this reaction. And as always, please do make sure to go and subscribe to the Fat Electrician. Awesome videos that he has there. Uh, perhaps I will be checking the one on uh, well, not perhaps I will be checking the one on Operation Brain Mantis. That sounds amazing. But that being said, though, we should all have a wonderful day. See you guys in the next one. Bye. Thank you.